welcome to the first episode of Bucket Talk with Coach T. Uh, first guest is uh, none other than Joey Hammond. I'm super excited to have him on uh, as my first guest on this podcast. So kind of kind of run down a little bit about him and why you should want to listen to what he has to say. We've got a lot of questions and some things that we want to go through. Um, and so anyway, so uh, Joey was a four year varsity player at Governor Tom Thomas Johnson High School state champion in 1992. Frederick News Post Player of the Year 1995, three-year starter at UNC Charlotte, never missing an inning, uh, named all-conference team in 1998 after batting 398, was drafted in 1998 by the Orioles in the 25th round, and spent 11 years playing professional baseball for the Orioles and for the Phillies. Um, made it to and spent lots of years at the AAA level, AA level. He spent a little bit of time in uh, some big league spring training around some big league players. Career 274 hitter with over 1,100 hits, named to the Reading Phillies All-Decade Team 2000 to 2009, won three state titles at Westchester Country Day School, appearing in four state titles out of five seasons at the helm, where he's built a program and developed dozens of college baseball players and dozens of college grads. Currently, the assistant coach with Wake Forest University serves as the first base coach while working with hitters and the outfielders has worked and developed several top uh, draft picks during his time with the Deeks. Um, obviously, right now, runs a travel baseball program as well, very competitive in that market, and was also named the 2019 YMCA Frederick Sports Hall of Fame inductee as well. Uh, father to three boys, Caleb, Josh, and Mason, husband to Rebecca, uncle and hero to Travis, loved and respected by all, Joey Hammond, ladies and gentlemen. So, um, did I miss anything? Did I get anything wrong? I don't know. I was about to take a nap. That was a long one, man, but I appreciate that. Well, when you have a long, good career, you know, you deserve a long, good introduction. I guess, apparently. I appreciate <laughs> the last part the best, though. That's the truth. Absolutely. Absolutely. Me too. Ex me too. So, um, so obviously, we've been trying to get caught up in, uh, for a little bit now and kind of talk about some baseball. And so I want to start there, just spend maybe 10 minutes or so talking about some baseball, just catching up obviously unique times, um, unprecedented times. And so just wanting to get your perspective, kind of your thoughts, you know, we're three to four weeks removed from, you know, NCAA shutting down the season, things like that happening. Kind of walk me through where you're at now versus where you were, you know, four weeks ago when this thing kind of first hit. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's wild. Um, you know, we supposed to be, at University of Virginia right now uh, playing tonight, uh, which is a really unique kind of, uh, you know, humbling and, and and can be a little demoralizing when you think about it that way. But the point is things have changed, man. The whole landscape's changed. And, you know, I think, uh, uh, you know, where we were a few weeks ago to where we are right now, uh, it's, it's, it's outrageous to think about that. And uh, the new normal that we're going to have to get used to over a period of time, uh, I think everybody's handling it in different ways. I don't think there's any wrong way necessarily, but um, you know, it's been a lot of uh, moments of reflection and, uh, get, uh, you know, the benefit obviously is you get to spend more time with your family, which yeah. is certainly a huge benefit. Um, but uh, the, the transition is, is certainly not easy. likes to be active and, and most folks in our profession is, you know, prefer to be active. Um, and it's been a challenge, but uh, we've been really resourceful in the ways in which reach out to our players and communicate with them in different ways, uh, learning a lot more about technology than I've ever learned before. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but again, it's, it's just a different time, you know? Yeah, I, I understand completely. So where are you at as far as, again, the first, just personally, you know, uh, being a baseball lifer, obviously loving the game uh, as much as I do, if not more. Um, so what's, you know, just from that kind of, personal perspective, not necessarily the family, not necessarily your players, but, you know, you not being able to turn on a live game or you not necessarily being able to go and do, you know, what it is that you, that you do for a living. Um, how has that impacted you personally? And kind of what are some things that help you continue to kind of go through the grind and the monotony of each day, knowing that we're going to get back to work? I mean, how has that impacted kind of your preparation and staying focused yet still finding the silver lining and, and obviously, the good and the bad that we're currently experiencing. Yeah. You know, I think, um, I think you're just kind of working our way through that right now. Uh, I think we're trying to figure that out. And uh, you know, for me, it's, it's, it's not been easy uh, kind of going through the full gamut and wide, 
in a range of, of, of actions and, and even emotions from that standpoint. But, uh, um, you know, kind of things that, that, that I'm doing is, is just, you know, not watching any obviously live games, but there's fortunately been a lot of old, old games that have been on, you know, on MLB network, there's a lot of old time games that, uh, that are on and, and refresh my memory of some entertaining to kind of dive back into it. Um, some memories of youth and childhood and all that kind of stuff. But, uh, but, you know, one of the things that, uh, that I've been doing to try to stay fresh and, and to see, like, you know, many people, it's probably still a little early to think about this, but you know, in times of crisis and situations like this, there's a lot of time, a lot of things can be born from situations like this. And it's hard to look at it like that right now. Um, but, uh, but there's going to be opportunities that are going to come from this, unfortunately, because a lot of people are not going to, take advantage of this time and they're not going to be prepared to hit the ground running moving forward. Um, there's going to be a lot of opportunities lost by people because they didn't take advantage of this time to continue to, you know, improve their craft and their profession. And so uh, one of the things that I've tried to do, and again, you mentioned our travel organization that we got from nine years old, 15 years old, and there's over hundred kids is uh, each day in the morning, I'll send them a daily plan. Uh, every one of our kids, um, not it's not individualized, but there's a a text message and email that I'll send out to all our coaches, and it'll have some physical drills for them to do. Um, you know, a throwing program. Uh, you know, different little drills you can do. And again, most all of this is is under the the impression as if you don't have access to a facility. It's literally in your backyard. It's uh, you know, with or without partners, you can do a lot of this stuff on your own because certainly we're in a Kind of a quarantine type time and uh, you know so it'll have some physical things um some different drills some different exercises to stay in shape physically and then my favorite thing is there's a baseball iq um question scenario exercise every single day it may be something like um you know a mental rep of of the process is like from going in hole to on deck to in a batter's box and and the different things that should be going through your mind through that process and other times it could be uh, I could send them a clip of the uh, you know, bottom of the ninth inning of a big playoff game and then have them walk me through different scenarios that had happened and at each position and, you know, to even some history lessons as it relates to Wally Pip and Lou Gehrig and different things like that. Um, you know, just trying to keep their fr minds fresh and taking advantage of this opportunity for them to develop, grow, and improve so that when we do hit the ground running after this, our guys didn't miss an opportunity. And um, and the hope is we come out better. Yeah, absolutely. Now, are you seeing what's kind of the the feedback um, on that? Is it mandatory to complete these programs uh, or the complete the daily drills? Is it optional? What kind of um, engagement? Because obviously, every coach out there, you know, myself, I just had a call with with the coach that I work with. Uh, we're all trying to find ways to get better and and obviously engage kids from a distance. Um, what are you seeing as far as engagement, percentage, um, excitement, or are you in your teams like most other teams where, you know, some will, some won't um, sort of thing. So what are you doing to increase engagement, but also where is your kind of engagement with, with that? So I think it's pretty strong. I've been hearing positive things from our coaches uh, as it relates back to, you know, messages sent from uh, players. I've actually encouraged them to continue to send me videos of different outside the box type training that they're doing on their own. Um, so I think the, the, the response has been positive, but again, you got to keep in mind, this is a, a market of, of kids that are, are, you know, this is, you know, we specifically target players who uh, are interested in the development of the game and not just going out and trying to compete and win games all the time. And so this is right up their alley. Um, having said that, you're also dealing with nine to 15 year old kids. And so the reality is you give them a bunch of time and all the different, distractions in the form of video games and all those things can really, you know, take, take hold. And so I don't know the exact answer to that. And, and truthfully, the measures that we're doing, um, me specifically, or our coaches, uh, we're not really making it mandatory, um, but we don't make a lot of things mandatory. I mean, the reality is this is their career. We want to try to impress upon them um, that uh, there's opportunities, there's resources, there's, there's things that are out there. But at the end of the day, you need to take hold of these things yourself. And if it's important enough to you, then you'll make it important enough to do this work. There's a fine line there. And again, the biggest caveat in all this is, is I think this is where parenting and coaching comes into play, is that you have to identify 
the audience that you work with, you know, and our parents know these kids better than I do in, in that regard. And you'll know a certain player uh, needs a little bit more tug, you know, and a push in a direction. And others just need to kind of be mentioned and brought it to their attention. Again, I can, I'm experiencing that in my own household. I got three boys. They have their daily plans every day. And in some cases, and some some of my boys individually, I may just mention, hey, you know, you're getting fine. <laughs> you go out and do the drill. And that's enough to go. And others, it may take a, hey, man, I'm tired of sitting here watching this. You, you, you're going to go out and do something? And sometimes you need to push some of that motivation. But at the end of the day, I'm really hesitant and careful with that because, you know, I want it to be important enough to them for them to do it. Because I know there's going to come a time in which you're not going to have a parent there to hold you by the hand and to physically make you or force you to go do what you need to do. I know having lived it, the college to pro ranks, there's not going to be people there that are going to motivate you or encourage you. In fact, you'll actually get some of the opposite of that in some of your teammates in a pro ball scenario that are friends, but they're competing against you too. And they're not really interested in you going out and continuing to get better to take their job. They're happy with you being content and playing video games and not getting any better. So I'm trying to help put this information out there and, uh, and if it's important enough to them, they'll do it. And if it's not important enough to them, then they won't. Yeah. Makes perfect sense. And, and I, I figured, um, I figured that's exactly what you'd say because, you know, I, I obviously had a front row seat to your career for, for my entire life. And so um, I saw no one, no one was there pushing you out the door. Uh, no one was making you go to do it. And, and the same thing, no one pushed me out the door. No one made me go do it, but you know, we grew up just always playing baseball. You know, I had this, uh, a little mini bat by my desk. And I always remember that, you know, the paper, paper baseball games that we played in the, the ghost runners and the situations, man, we didn't, you know, we didn't just take a bunch of boring reps off of a tee. Cause I know that can get kind of old and monotonous, uh, but we were always playing the game. We were always studying the game. If it was raining, we played indoor baseball until we got in trouble. Um, you know, and then we moved into video games when those things started to come out, but you're still learning the game. You're still around the game. So how do you balance that? Obviously, kind of, again, being that baseball lifer, no one ever had to push you out the door. In fact, you had to be called in uh, to stop practicing baseball. So how how have you seen kind of from where you came up in the, you know, through the late 80s, early 90s, little technology, way more baseball, and that was just something that you did. But how do you kind of balance that? I mean, what's that, what's that look like from a parent's perspective or a coach's perspective from – man, I'm just a lifer. I'm a grinder. I love baseball. I can't get enough versus, Hey, this kid, you know, he could kind of take it or leave it, but how do you allow them to be on the team, but not necessarily push them? How would you approach that if you had a kid on your team? Yeah, it's hard. Um, it's hard. And, uh, uh, you know, again, it's different. And so it's, it's easy to say, Hey, back when I played and this, well, things are different, you know, yeah. they're different. I don't think kids are different. Uh, the reality is as much as I'd like to, to, uh, to believe it, it, you know, if I had the same kind of um, distractions and technology and, and, and the ability of social media and things like that, um, I'd like to say that I'd still have gotten as much work in as I, as I did, but yeah, I don't know. Um, I mean, it's really tempting and it's difficult. And uh, I try really hard not to be judgmental in that regard um, and, uh, and understand that times are different. The kids aren't different though. Let's just get that get that straight. It's really easy for us as coaches and parents to say, ah, oh, kids are different now than they used to be. I totally disagree with that. I, I think our society is different and the things around them are different, but they process things the same way, generally speaking. So I think it's our job as coaches and parents to try to uh, get creative and use technology to our advantage if we need to. Look, if, you know, and we've done this at Wake Forest, I know you've seen it, but um, technology is appealing. And so our job is to try to create, you know, technology and use that uh, as a way to continue to develop the things that we know are really important to reality at Wake. Um, it's like a giant, awesome video game, uh, but it's tailored in a way that helps our guys develop, um, you know, and be on time and be comfortable about the opponent and the opposing pitcher and different, you know, pitch, you know, uh, types and speeds and, and all those things that uh, it's like playing a video game uh, is what you, what's appealing to the player, uh, but at the same time, it's, it serves a benefit as well. And I think that's what we've got to do. 
Yeah, makes sense. So kind of talk me because obviously I, I got to see the work ethic. I got to I got to try to live up to the work ethic standard that you set um, for me and for everyone else that that has played with you or has watched you play. So you have played baseball with a lot of talented players, both you know, high school, college, along the way. What separated you um, from everyone else, right? From the other good players in your town, on your team, in your league, why were you able to make it to, you know, minor leagues and have a long sustained professional career? Again, 1,100 hits, that's no small feat. Um, what separated you from the other really good players also? Was it just your work ethic? Did you get lucky? Uh, right place, right time? You know, kind of what separated you from those those other good players in your area? Uh, probably a lot of all of the above. Um, you know, again, obviously, you know, I had, had great role model of work ethic at my house. Obviously, my mother was was phenomenal in that regard and, and uh, fighting and toughness, and that, you know, and, and had to fight and earn everything. I learned at an early age that uh, things aren't going to be given to you and that the things that are most worth going after um, are, are certainly enjoyed better when you earn them rather than when they're given to you. And so um, I just kind of, I guess I appreciate at an early age that when you earn something, and it, it comes to fruition. That's just a great sense of accomplishment. And, um, and, and certainly realize that, you know, the harder you work and the more work you put in and the more you develop, then the more likely you are to experience success. It doesn't guarantee it, but the more likely you are. Yeah, who doesn't like to be successful? So realize that kind of early on. And so maybe that work ethic, drive, um, example, uh, certainly played a role in it. But, but look, you know, I was fortunate enough to be around really quality people and quality coaches at each stage in my career and life. And uh, they were all there at the perfect time for me for the perfect area of development that I needed. And so in that regard, I'm certainly blessed and fortunate. And, uh, um, was blessed with some God-given ability. But um, yeah, I guess just the daily drive to want to um, be able to put my head down on pillow at night when my career was going to be over and have no regrets in that regard um, from a a work standpoint and an effort standpoint, those things are controllable. And so, you know, those things are probably the best determined factor I'd say. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. I love it. So it kind of, we had a question I was going to come to and you kind of mentioned it. Um, do you have any baseball regrets? Do you have anything? Do you have uh, looking back and say, if I, you know, I could have worked harder here or I had some more time here, or I kind of got distracted here or literally when you lay your head down at night, you know what? I gave everything I could to my uh, professional baseball career. And um, obviously the result speaks to that, but I'm satisfied. Or do you have some areas where you're like, man, I could have worked a little bit harder, even being a hard worker. Did you still leave any on the table or you literally gave it all? So, um, I mean, maybe one rep here, one rep there. I think certainly everybody has more. That's a mantra that I'll use a lot of times is she can always do more. Um, but big picture wise, uh, it's one of the greatest gifts that I have to give to my kids and to the co players that I coach is um, to talk about the tremendous peace that comes with having the ability to put your head on the pillow at night, knowing you have reached your highest maximum potential. Um, and have no regrets in that regard. And so um, from that standpoint as a player, none. And there's a tremendous piece that comes with that that I wish every player will have, regardless of it. And does that mean that I reached the goal that I wanted to reach necessarily? No, because um, it's a lot of those things are outside of your control. Um, and, uh, you know, but, but I do, th I think, um, you know, from maybe even a non-baseball standpoint from a regret, I, and maybe the only thing I can think of is, there were probably some times there in my career that I, 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 w I may have been able to be a, a little bit more aggressive as an advocate for myself as a player, um, you know, and, and, and push things, maybe demand some things later in my career that may have directed me to get a, open a door here or there. But uh, in doing that, I probably would have sacrificed some of the things that make me who I am anyway. And so from that standpoint, you know, not a great either. Yeah. Yeah. And that's one of the things, you know, and, and so everyone that meets you, everyone that kind of, as far as I'm concerned, that, that knows you and has either played with you, learned from you, whatever the case may be. I think that's one of the things that sets you apart. And it's just, you know, when you leave your, the presence of you, it's like, man, he's just different. And I think that's why, because you don't compromise um, things that are important to you to have maybe been a big league player. So yeah, you may have been a big league player. 
uh, but you had to compromise so that, like you mentioned a few minutes ago, the satisfaction wouldn't have been as great. It wouldn't have felt as sweet or tasted as sweet because you had to kind of do this to get there versus, you know, maybe doing it the right way. And so, you know, again, that's one of the things that that I've always loved and admired. And I think a lot of other people uh, do as well. Um, so kind of favorite, favorite, this is kind of hard, favorite coach or favorite player, favorite teammate kind of, but talk to me, you know, what's your, if you had to pick one coach, right, you're, you're on a, you're on an Island, um, you know, and, and you have one coach, one baseball coach that you could kind of learn from the rest of your life, who would be your favorite coach? Who's the, the favorite coach you've played with favorite player or teammate that you've played with, or kind of, you know, talk me through that. What are, what are, you know, is it a professional? Is it still the, the little league coach that you love? You know, where do you fall in that stance? Yeah. Thanks for asking me that. That's a great question. It um, is. It's hard. Put me in a real tough spot. But look, uh, the best way I can answer that is it depends on which version of me is going to be on that island. All right. Because as I mentioned before, if it, you're talking about Little League, I had great Little League coaches. And, you know, Danny Miller comes to mind. And, and then in, 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 in Babe Ruth, Roy Main, Terry, uh, Terry Shaw, and then high school, Jerry. Foyt, um, and in college, Lauren Hibbs and Mike Shield. Um, I, again, wherever you go, I mean, that's the best way I can answer that, even in pro ball. Um, if you're going to ask me, you know, which person I learned the most baseball from, um, it's say Mike Shield, who's currently the manager of the St. Louis Cardinals right now. He's one of our assistant coaches at, at UNC Charlotte. Great relationship. Stay in touch with him now. He's still someone that I would confide in even now when I have a question about something and he's phenomenal as a human being to take my call and, and, uh, and, and we'll talk things out and, you know, get some advice from him even now. So from a baseball standpoint, he'd be the guy, but again, it's, it's an impossible question to answer just because of the different phases that I had in my life. Yeah. Yeah. And you spoke to that and I kind of expected that answer would be the, would be similar like that because you really can't answer that. But I was just curious. And obviously uh, coach Schilt, phenomenal, yeah. you know, knew him from, from many years ago. Um, talk to me about your favorite, you know, we talked about, obviously you had this, this big goal, this big vision of wanting to, you know, be a big league player. And, and while that goal wasn't ultimately achieved, what is your greatest baseball accomplishment? Like when you look back and, and obviously you're, you're several years removed from playing, when you look back and say, hey, you know what? I'm really proud of this achievement or this accomplishment within my baseball career. Do you have a favorite baseball accomplishment? Uh, a couple of things come to mind, but it, the prevailing, overwhelming thing I'm most proud of is, is what I mentioned before, is, is that there, there aren't any regrets. And I, I've met so many folks and peers and former teammates of mine that are great friends of mine that uh, will always say, hey, if I had just done this or, you know, an injury or something like that that kind of derailed them um the fact that i i don't say that is probably what i'm um, the accomplish what i'm most happy of accomplishing um you know hits that, that was you know just because it speaks to consistency you know and longevity difficult to do um and pro baseball that was a special uh kind of time and moment and um you know, come to men's in college just playing you know every inning of every game since the moment I stepped foot on campus until the time I had left for pro baseball. Uh, pretty proud of that. Again, speaks to consistency, you know, treating things in, as a professional and professional manner. And um, and certainly a lot of that is getting some breaks too, because I, I certainly gave Coach Hibbs a lot of opportunities to not play me my first, you know, a few games when I started off 0-15. So that, uh, you know, I, I appreciate him staying with me. Yeah, absolutely. And and like, you you know, you mentioned earlier that obviously the work ethic, but sometimes being in the right place at the right time, having the right opportunities and having a coach like that, that believed in you enough to um, let you go through some struggles. And so, you know, that's, that's obviously really, really good. And to be able to have that. So talk to me through that, you know, you, you're a freshman uh, at UNC Charlotte, you know, and this can go for the freshman in high school or the nine-year-old in little league, whatever that kind of that next step is, or going from 12 where you're playing little bases to big bases. Talk to me about that, that kind of first couple of weeks, first couple of months where, you know, obviously the struggle from the beginning and how you were able to work through that. Did you just work harder? Did you, you know, what did you do to be able to get through that, those early struggles of, of what ultimately became a really successful college career? Yeah. So, it, you know, just, just continuing to work early on. I felt like work was the answer and me to an extent. I found out over years of my career that um, work in and of itself wasn't going to be enough to really speed that 
messed up. It came back to a certain approach and a mentality and a trust and a faith combined with work is what helped me be able to keep those gaps and that, those stressful times uh, a little bit shorter. Um, you know, I can recall again a, a, a conversation midway, uh, seven or eight years into pro baseball, I was a free agent. And I went over to sign and play with the Phillies uh, organization. And I went go play in the same league that I'd been playing in for three or four years, same level of baseball, just a different uniform, same ballparks, just different uniform. And I started off the worst start of my, you know, career. I think I was 17 for a hundred, no extra base hits, punts of strikeouts, hit 170. Um, and it was a really stressful time. And I remember having a conversation with Mike Schilt. And um, one of the things he told me stuck with me was, hey, listen, you know, we're going to get off this phone. And you're going to go back and look at the back of your baseball card. And you're going to call me back. And I'm thinking to myself, what is he talking about? Fortunately, my wife had one of my baseball cards. So I went and I looked at the back of it. I called him back and he's like, all right, did you read it? I'm like, yeah. He said, and I was like, I don't understand what you're trying to tell me. And he said, well, look, you are what the back of your baseball card says you are. You've been in this league forever. Uh, it's the same league, it's the same players. Um, you're going to finish the season. And once you put your head down and go back to work and just trust and have faith that you're going to finish the season, some version of what the back of your baseball card says you are. As bad as 100 at-bats are, you'll have these same 100 at-bats. They just don't have to be at the beginning with a new team all the time. Um, and uh, that faith and that trust and that comfort kind of came over me and as fate would have it, you know, I finished the season and batting average was a little lower than career average, but production and numbers, you know, were, were right on par with everything else by the end of that year. And so, um, you know, combination of work with trust and faith that the work that you've done and the preparation that you put in, if you're doing it right, affords you, you know, the benefit to have this approach and this mentality that you, you, you're, you're fine and you're going to be good and you'll come out of it and, kind of my mom used to say this too shall pass yeah very good point very good I, I remember that season I remember some of the phone calls uh that you had uh back home so to speak and 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 so um obviously you know and I've heard a different version of that where you know you take this and and uh you know different bite-sized samples but obviously as we know in baseball that you know this hundred of bats may go really really bad but you know it's just one little click one little you know uh, situation where the next hundred of bats, I mean, it could be unreal. So staying kind of focused. And so um, that brings me to kind of the next thing, obviously as a baseball coach. So we've kind of talked about and covered baseball player, uh, but let's kind of move into a little bit of, you know, baseball coach really starting kind of when the, when your career uh, ended and you became, you know, became a high school baseball coach. Um, you know, walk me through that kind of that transition of going from, you know, player to, now coach and not really having, yes, you had done some lessons and things like that, but not actually really being a coach of a team. How does that, how does that competitive, like, you know, Michael Jordan is not a really good um, executive, right? He's a great player, but he's, he just, you know, he kind of, how have you been successful as a coach and a player um, kind of walk me through that transition a little bit? Well, I had to have some mentorship in that regard too i was fortunate enough to be around a guy named david couch who's super successful in business and in life in general and is a great mentor of mine just as a human being um, and he was right there with me through the process and what that helped with was just just my general presence and the way in which i would handle adversity and how i would understand how leverage works and conversations and just those types of things that i just didn't really realize and didn't know and maybe did while I was playing, but just didn't really understand and how my body language and uh, to ask myself, what does it feel like to be coached by me? And those are things, those kind of tough questions are really important. And I was fortunate enough to have um, David be around me to kind of bring those things to light. The baseball stuff was simple. Yeah, you're in the game that long, the coaching and the X's and O's and the identification of talent and you know, what to do in certain situations and how best to help a kid. That's the easy stuff. Um, it, it, the, the challenging part is the ability to take that information and make it relatable to a player. And, um, and, and one of the things that I found out early on was the magic and all that is be able to connect to a player, each individual player, kind of where they're at and find out, you know, this type of player is, you know, this type of a learner. And this player is this type of a learner, and I have to be able to take the information I have and package it in a way that can be understandable from them. Um, you know, some guys you need to get in their face. Some guys you got to put your arm around them, 
and uh, coaching, that's what coaching is. You have to identify, is this a guy who I need to kind of get on a little bit, or is this a guy I need to pick up a little bit more um, and, and kind of, you know, be a psychiatrist, so to speak, is, is the best way to really look at it. So, um, you know, the baseball part was pretty simple, but uh, but I had some great mentorship in, in that regard from a, you know, leadership standpoint. Yeah, yeah. So, so I, I mentioned kind of in the intro, um, and I, I'm thinking I got that correct, but you went to, you appeared in four state championships in five years and won three of them? Yeah, that's right. Okay, so help me, you know, obviously that's a that's a big deal, right? And so we, we say that, and sometimes, you know, even uh, myself kind of watching that happen and being a fan from afar and different stuff, you know, you say that, and it's like, oh, you know, he won three state championships out of four in, in five seasons, and we just kind of say that, and it's like, oh, it's just, you know, but I mean, it's really, it's really a big deal. So what are what are some things that, you know, you did to ensure obviously winning a building program? What would you say, you know, is, is the, the core of uh, what you teach and what you preach and what you're about to really be able to create a winning organization and, and winning program that obviously two of your three sons are now fortunate enough to be a part of and play in and develop in, but you, you kind of, you got that started. I mean, and you built that. So what are, what are some things, what are the core, what's the core of, of what created that program and that successful formula that honestly, had you stayed, you know, you probably would have been repeating it by now. The, the, the first thing is um, there's no replacement or no matter how good of a coach you are, you don't have players, you don't have talent, you can't win. Uh, I don't, I don't care who you are. Um, look at every single successful coach yeah. that's out there and they've got multitude of great players. So that's the first thing. Uh, if you don't have ability and talent, you can't win. And certainly did. We did in the form of guys that are playing pro ball now, a high number of players played at college. And so that, that certainly played the biggest factor in all of it. Um, you know, from an approach and a mentality and a, you know, coaching standpoint, uh, one of the things that David and I kind of instilled there was this, this, this premise of, uh, and this understanding that we trusted that, um, that if you do things the right way, and if you value the right things, like being a great teammate, being accountable, uh, working hard, uh, being a great person, on and off the field, um, if you do things the right way, then winning will be a byproduct of doing those things the right way. And that it doesn't necessarily work the other way around. Just because you win, when you put an emphasis and focus on winning, look, I, I wanna win, all right? <laughs> Food tastes better when you win. Like I'm, I'm a big fan of winning, uh, but I understand that when win winning is the focal point, it doesn't necessarily mean that the byproduct is you get better as a player, and you're doing the right things and you're a better person. But the flip side of that is true. When you do everything and you develop and each and every player on your team gets marketably better, then your team gets better. And when that happens, you win. And so we were able to get this buy-in from our, our talented players uh, and build a culture that trusted that if we did things the right way and if we got better individually, then our team will get the result. Fortunately, we were able to do that in a quick manner, and uh, it continued to breed some buy-in, and uh, had a good good thing going, and it's certainly heading in that direction again. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Um, so I'm gonna kind of change gears a little bit, and then maybe kind of wrap up with a few questions, kind of some some parting things for young players. You know, maybe something to be doing during during this time. What you look for, kind of in a college from a college coach, like some things that you look for in a player. So we'll kind of get to that, but I'm going to kind of change gears, maybe lighten it up a little bit, be a little bit more fun and just kind of go through some word association and just, you know, give me one or two word answer. I'll give you a word. And then what do you associate? What do you think when you hear the word? Um, so we'll start out okay. with baseball. When you, when you hear the word baseball, I mean, what does that, what does that, what's the first word or the first phrase that kind of comes to your mind? Uh, love and life. Love and life. I'm pretty oh, simple. Fantastic. I, I know where I get it from. I feel the same exact way. Um, <laughs> How about coach? Uh, mentor. Um, and uh, I think that's just a better, I mean, just a mentor and love again. Yeah. Uh, what about diamond as in baseball diamond? Uh, a safe place. Okay. Uh, Derek Jeter. <laughs> the, the captain, the leader. Yeah. Uh, how about Cal Ripken? 
the same a pro and i said with all the respect in the world like i think that's one of the greatest terms and accomplishments that someone could be it could be said about them is that they were a pro. I, I take that word and I probably emphasize that word a lot more than what most people do. Um, uh, that, that word from a lot of professional players, when you call them a pro, it means a lot more than just getting paid to play a game. It, it's the way in which you go about yourself and he's the consummate pro. Yeah. That's kind of like the, the man's man, right? You know, we're all, we're kind of men by, we're, we're men by birth or men by gender. Uh, but it's that man's man. It's the, the, the man above other great men. And, you know, obviously we, we grew up right outside of Baltimore going to Camden Yards many times, watching Kyle Ripken uh, do his thing. And obviously you had a chance to go to uh, baseball camps, Kyle Ripken baseball camps. You met Kyle Ripken. So um, we'll come back to that in a second, but yeah, I mean, the, the, the pro is, I think, yeah. And, and, I, I can completely relate. So I'll leave it there. We'll come back to, to Kyle Ripken in just a minute. Uh, how about Pete yeah. Rose? Uh, a gamer. I mean, that's the best way to tell you. Dirty and a gamer. Yeah. So I think for me personally, I think, you know, pro, right? So it's like, man, it's a pro, that man's man. And then gamers like right below that, right? So, you know, you, we, we all yeah, want the Kyle right Ripkins there. on our team. Because they provide the leadership, they provide the consistency, they provide the, you know what you're going to get day in and day out, obviously 2,600 games in a row, you knew what you were getting. Um, but you always but you always want that Pete Rose on your team too, that guy that's yeah. going to go steal the base, you know, put the you butt down. Yeah, so um, I like that. I like that. Um, how, about, uh, how about Yankees, when you hear Yankees? Uh, class, so it goes with it, and winners. Okay. Uh, T work, T drills. Uh, a staple, extremely important and okay. under appreciated. I agree. I agree. Um, infield outfield. So infield outfield before a game, what does that, what does that mean to you? And that's yeah, that's all it should be um, preparation and execution. speaking. I like that. And I, I love, I'm a huge infield outfield guy. I, I obviously were, we were down at Wake Forest a couple weeks ago and watching infield outfield. Um, I just, a good clean infield outfield can be extremely intimidating to the other team. Um, you know, I, I've been on both sides of that. I get off the bus and I watch a team that has some music playing. They take a good clean infield outfield and you're on your heels right away. I've also been the good yeah. team that does the crisp, crisp, clean infield outfield. And even if we weren't the better team, when you have your opponent on your heels, uh, I think that can that obviously starting the game that way can can be a good advantage. So, um, by the way, uh, he Joey is the best infield outfield hitter I've ever seen. Um, <laughs> no pressure, but it is crispy and clean, so it's a good thing to watch. It's like watching I a hit dance a lot routine. of ground balls at shortstop in my day. <laughs> <laughs> hey, again, finding the silver lining, right? Um, who knew that all those that's ground right. outs would have, would have prepared you for something? That's right. I just don't have to um, run now. Exactly. Uh, all right. So I got three more. So when you hear success, what do you think? Oh, man. Uh, the goal. I mean, I think of the goal achieved. Okay. And that's what your goal is, to be successful. Absolutely. So on the flip side of that, when you hear failure, what do you think of? Uh, another opportunity. Love it. Yeah. And the last oh. one. Yeah. Uh, the last one, uh, all baseball players can relate, which to me makes baseball players and people that spend more time in the game of baseball, uh, better employees, better parents, uh, better, you know, potentially, uh, is the word slump. What do you think of when you hear the word slump? Uh, again, I, 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 an opportunity and uh, for growth and improvement Man. Yeah, and, and inevitable too, to an extent, and you're going to go through some ups and downs. Absolutely. Absolutely. Fantastic. All right. So we'll kind of, we'll kind of transition away from that and we'll, we'll cut us a little bit shorter. Obviously we had some technical difficulties getting started. Um, so kind of transition into a few more kind of questions, but let's talk about Cal Ripken. Um, obviously, you know, 1994, we had the strike. Um, you know, if you're unfamiliar with the strike, the players and owners couldn't get, on the same page financially. So, you know, we talked about that personally off, off camera the other day, but 
you know, Cal Ripken, kind of talk me, talk me through 1994 and the disappointment of no baseball towards the end of the season. And then 1995, how Cal Ripken and the chase for the streak and all that kind of the best you can walk me through that, because I feel like a lot of fans were mad at baseball because they were bickering back and forth versus this, this issue is not a, is not a baseball specific issue, right? I think we're going to be more unified coming out of this as a baseball community. Um, But talk to me, you know, kind of, again, back in the 94, 95 time when adversity and no baseball and, and as a fan, as a player, as a whatever, and then watching Cal Ripken and how he, basically put the game of baseball on his back and said, let's, let's kind of bring this, um, bring this back and better than ever. So kind of talk to me as, you know, any memories you have of that time frame and some things that you were thinking and kind of what's happened after that. Yeah. There's a stark difference between then and now, you know, they're both the consistent thing is that there's no baseball. Um, but, uh, but it was a really tar- tough time, a dark time at, at, at that particular time. And it was, uh, baseball wasn't very highly thought of at that point, and and unlike today, uh, there wasn't a lot of demand to want to see it. They were frustrated fans, and really so. They were frustrated that these two big powers couldn't figure it out to put a product out there to entertain, and uh, and they deserved to feel that way. And uh, so I, I I totally understood that. Um, and quite honestly, you could make an argument that uh, had it not been for Cal Ripken and that streak and his ability to make that happen. Uh, we might not have the same feelings about baseball now as we do, and we might not be missing it as bad <laughs> as we do right now. Um, you know, a lot of people argue that he stayed the game, and I don't think it's a, a stretch to say that. Uh, I think the game probably would have continued, but I don't think it would be in the in the place that it's right now. Um, and that's the difference right now. You know, fans are longing for it. They want it. And the reality is, though, there's still some damage in place. It's going to look different, and it's going to be different. Um, just like it was different when they came back from the strike and we needed something to rally behind. And my hope is, and I'm sure that will, there's so much talent out there that we'll have another Cal Ripken of sorts to, to, to hold on to. Uh, because there's a lot of things, even as much as we like it, there's a lot of things about baseball that people aren't really happy about. You got the Astros scandal and just a number of different things that uh, are not, but the reality is it'll come back. And when it does, there'll be a new positive story like the Cal Ripken that can continue to carry this and move it on to the next generation and the next. Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense. Um, you know, I, I agree. I'm in the camp that Cal Ripken saved baseball. I think, you know, fast forward a few summers after that 1998, I think Mark McGuire and Sammy Sosa uh, chasing the home run record, obviously took what Cal Ripken saved and those two guys in that competition uh, took baseball kind of to the next level. Um, with some controversy that obviously went along with that, which, you know, we'll save that for another conversation, but I definitely think Kyra can save the game of baseball. And then, like I said, Mark McGuire and Sammy Sosa, you know, kind of took it to that next level and then Barry Bonds and and so forth. Um, Mm -hmm. So when you think of, when you think of baseball and you think of how it corresponds to, you know, life and, and failure and, and have, obviously you're going to fail more than you succeed. How do you, how do you, um, how do you use the game of baseball to, to coach and mentor? You know, you, you've mentioned earlier coach as being a mentor. So how do you use the game of baseball to, and the failures that go along with playing a, a sport as hard as baseball and, and connect it to, you know, struggles in life and connect with that young player and kind of say, Hey, you know, this is okay. Like, how do you, how do you help a kid through that slump? How do you help a, a how do you help someone else through stumps that you've been through and needed help through also? Yeah. So that's the easy thing. I mean, that, that because like you mentioned, there's such parallels between life and, and baseball in itself, because it's, it's a game that has a lot of things that are outside of your control and there's only so many things that you can, uh, and you're going to experience failures and, and highs and lows. And, and so the, the, the best thing and the easiest thing is that it is so relatable. And so there are millions of opportunities uh, in the game of baseball that you can take and apply it uh, to real life scenarios that make it make sense to the kids and the players. And that's what makes it so unique. And I'm sure you could do a version of that with the other sports, uh, but I'm just, I'm biased, I'm sure. But I, I don't think that, you know, there's another sport out there that's going to be able to have as many readily available stories that pertain and relate to life situations 
uh, that made it that much easier for kids and players and people uh, to learn, adapt, and develop. Yeah, makes sense. And that's, you know, one of the things that that's why I've decided to do what I'm doing, right? And that's following kind of in your footsteps um, and wanting to teach life and mentor, you know, life through the game of baseball, because I feel like it, the parallels are so closely connected more so than any other sport as you know, you do fail in other sports, but you know, Tom Brady doesn't become Tom Brady if he misses seven out of 10 passes. Um, You know, yet Derek Jeter is going into the hall of fame this year as a 300 hitter, which basically says he failed seven out of 10 times. Uh, So again, that's the correlation. That's why I think the life and and baseball parallel a lot closer than other sports. Um, So Kind of along that same um, same thread or same kind of thought process. What are what are three things that like young players? And when I say young, you know, obviously eighteen year olds are now young to me, which is kind of crazy. Um, you know, as as you get older and life goes on, it's like, man, you know, the young players are are like, man, that guy's younger than me playing in the big. But anyway, um, what are three things? Top three things that you know, like a, somebody under the age of twelve, and then maybe three things that someone over the age of twelve can do to kind of set themselves apart, right? And say, hey, to show a coach that you know what I I am not like the masses. I want to take this game to the next level. And they're not necessarily, you know, yes, work ethic and yes, you know, a, a player telling a coach, but like, what are some of the things that they could be doing? Is it just drills? Is it the mental reps? Like if they had to focus on specific areas to, to really take themselves to the next level and say, Hey, I want to be a real contender as far as baseball is concerned. Um, what are, what are some, th- some things that they should really be focused on? So um, without getting into too many details, because there's a million different drills and different things that you can do that are going to help in that regard, there's a couple categories I'd put them in the first, and because there are a lot of times they're often overlooked, and yet they're they're overlooked by the players and the parents, uh, but they're certainly not overlooked by the evaluators, the coaches, the scouts, and and, and things like that. Um, the first one is the commitment development, uh, meaning uh, you know, put eggs in the basket of development and training more so than just the exposure and the notoriety. Those things come with that development, but uh, the commitment to that, um, the next one would be, uh, and this is what's lost on a lot of people, is the type of teammate you are. That really matters. It really is important, and college coaches and pro scouts are absolutely looking at that. Uh, focus on being a great teammate. That doesn't just mean uh, be the guy that they can count on in certain situations. It also means uh, putting others ahead of you, making sure that you have your middle infielders loving their hat ready and they're going and you're playing catch and that you make yourself available and you're picking them up and you're patting them on the back and being a great teammate, genuinely invest in your team. Uh, and I think that's a, that's a big, big part of it. And the last category I put it into is mental toughness is as you may deal with failure and deal with adversity uh, and, and, and really focus just concentrate on that. Like, it's okay if college coaches to see that you're upset and you got out. Like, I don't want guys going back and giving high fives because they just struck out. Like, I don't want you being excited about failing. But at the same token, understand the message that you said when you're, you can't control that um, and you throw a helmet and you slam and you outburst and you carry it out to the field with you. The one thing we know is levels go up and up and the older you get and the better you get, the competition gets harder and harder. And so the, the reality is you're going to fail more and more. So if you can't handle the degree of failure that you have at the age and the level you're at right now, you're giving you know some coaches some questions about whether or not you can handle what we know is going to come at the next level, which is more failure um, because competition is better. So uh, being tough to handle adversity uh, and deal with that, I think that's a, a way overlooked aspect um, that I would absolutely encourage players to do a job of. Yeah. So how do you, you know, if, and, and, you know, some people are born with born into and experience more adversity and more life than, than others. You know, I, I talk about, I experienced way more life in my uh, 18 years before meeting my wife than she did in her 18 years. So if you don't have adversity or if you're not ex- exposed to as much adversity or life, so to speak, What's, what's the way that you can really, you know, is there a way that you can train around that or kind of can you train that mental muscle or how do you train that mental, mental muscle, especially now without striking out, right? It's hard to simulate the feelings of a strikeout with the guy, the tying run on third base. So how, do, how would you practice mental reps and mental strength, especially right now, but even when things are back to normal, so to speak, um, how, how do you practice mental reps? Like what do you, what's something that you can kind of help us with, to get better in that area? 
Yeah, so, so this, again, this is a simple one here, too, because it's a great question. A lot of people don't know or they can't look beyond their own situation, but it, it, it speaks to being a good teammate. Having to put yourself in other people's position, whether you have a difficult time or not, uh, if you have empathy and you feel for your teammates or you feel for your friends or your community or whatever, it's easy to put yourself in their situation and feel to a degree what they're feeling, whether it be failure, success, tragedy, trauma, whatever. Um, and uh, that's a really easy way to do it. Uh, but you got to think outside the box. And again, empathy is a is a trait that is lost on a lot of people. I think it's really important to be able to put yourself in their situation and be a good teammate and allow yourself to think what that might feel like. And uh, it certainly can prepare you for when the situation hits you in the face. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you had kind of mentioned faith, you know, a little bit and, and obviously in your coaching in the part where we're talking about coaching and obviously, you know, as a player and n knowing you personally, um, you know, I know faith is, is a big deal and that's not something that we really talk about at, at, you know, high levels necessarily or in public places. And I always coach around faith being an action word versus, you know, being a religious, right. Being, being faith doesn't mean religion. We religion use, use the word faith, you know, but you have faith that the car is going to start when you put the key in the ignition, you have faith that you're going to get better at the game of baseball. And if you don't have that faith, then why would you go put that work in um, um, to begin with? Right. If you don't have faith that it's going to help you get better. So to, to not make faith a bigger word than what it is, but how has faith played a part in, in obviously your life or your playing career, you know, uh, mentally preparing for a game, mentally, you know, the 0 for 4 with the four strikeout game, the, the struggle early in college, the struggle, you know, changing teams in, in pro ball. How has faith played a part in that and being able to kind of pick you back off the mat and keep you going? Every day, you're, you're absolutely right. It has been forever in the state my life whether it be it's it's in the meaning uh, that's based on religion uh, or to your daily actions it's been all my life and it has been and it will continue to be and i just don't know how uh, people can go through a day in their life and function without having that as a center you know force and um, and i know that they do and uh but i can't relate to that and so um it plays a huge role um and and it helps you pick yourself back up and the faith that you know that uh, this too shall pass an opportunity will be presented to you um, and to take advantage of it and have faith in your preparation and the work that you've put in have faith in your relationships, have faith in your partner, have faith in your uh, friends and your family and all those things that come into play a huge part of my life on a daily basis. And as you said, it's a great, great way to put it. It's an action word. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right. So let's kind of, kind of wrap up a few more questions and then um, kind of, obviously in, in this, uh, but what do you, what do you prioritize in a practice session? Uh, or even as you mentioned, the daily emails that go out to, you know, your organization, um, is it drill mindset fitness or kind of what is the priority? What's the main thing that you're trying to get across to your team, whether in person at wake or within the diamond Deacons organization, uh, with the younger players, like what's that, you know, or does it change based on the group that you're trying to communicate with? But what's like as a coach, this is my priority. I'm a defensive guy or I'm an offensive guy or I'm a, you know, small ball guy. I mean, what's kind of what's that that your approach, your style, so to speak? So I think some of it will develop will depend on the group that you're kind of around and things in which they do well or things in which they need to to, to improve upon. Um, so it does change. You, you have to have a big library of opportunities and drills and tools to try to help because as I said each player is going to be a little different therefore each team is going to be a little different and so you think great coaches in my opinion have the ability to adapt to all of that um, I do think that a great practice have some version of every aspect of the game big and small whether it be an offensive portion a defensive portion a base running portion some conditioning going on here um, you know, but at the core of it is just general fundamentals and an aversion of execution. Because at the end of the day, that's really what it comes back down to. Um, being fundamental, fundamentally correct, trust that, and then execute. And uh, I think every good practice is going to have some versions of those that's at its center. Yeah. Um, having grown up in a time when technology was not obviously even around, you know, we, we didn't have a computer until I think you had already graduated from high school in our house. So, or close to it. Uh, so we obviously grew up in a time when, when technology wasn't certainly in the palm of your hand or, or even on your wrist. So have, 
obviously technology has changed and a lot of things have changed. What is, what is kind of that core of baseball that, you know what, I don't care how fancy you get. I don't care how, you know, technology, VR, whatever the case may be, it doesn't matter. This in the game of baseball has to be there or it won't be the same or, or what hasn't changed. What's still just the same with baseball as it was back in the backyard playing pickup games versus now where we're doing virtual practices and we haven't even touched virtual reality yet. What's, but what's kind of stayed that same simple. within the game of baseball? Yeah, it's simple again. Uh, competition, man. Compete. Uh, the, the guys that can compete and that uh, make that a priority, make that important, and that appreciate that fight, that grind, that competition, and they thrive in that situation, it doesn't matter what surrounding situations you put around them, um, they're going to be successful. Again, you, you can see the greatness really come up when you add technology and some of these different techniques to that. But at the end of the day, the greatest competitors are going to be your best players. And that's always been that way. And it'll always be that way. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, what's, what's the thing, what's a, a, a thing that you wish. So going from kind of old school baseball to this modern day travel uh, baseball uh, atmosphere that we live in, which obviously we know is not going to go back to the way it used to be um, anything, you know, just like a rubber band, when you stretch it and never goes back to its original size our new normal won't be what it looked like before this whole thing happened. So along those same premises and same things, what's something in the game of baseball that's changed that you wish wouldn't, that you wish could be more old school or, you know, still taught, still important, still valued. What's, what's one or two things that um, you don't look around and see around the game of baseball that, that you wish you did. Well, kind of that, as I mentioned, I, I, I embrace the analytics of the game. I think they're great tools uh, to learn and develop better. Um, I, I wish we would get away from the analytics being the great defining and de you know definition of greatness or success or fail based off of that. They're tools to help us develop and get better, and we can learn from them. Um, and I wish we could get back to some more things that are a little bit more controllable, um, and we could, you know, uh, qualify and, and, and reward quality at bats as opposed to being more results based. And uh, I mean, that's just, just, you know, selfishly something that, that uh, comes across my mind when I think about the difference between kind of more then than now um, it's the embracing of the analytics of for what it's real value is. Gotcha. Um, so it kind of goes into my next question, which is if you were the commissioner of baseball, let's say that there was a, a, a commissioner of all of baseball, you know, you kind of, you have the decision and what you say, kind of all the other organizations, baseball organizations kind of go along with that. Um, what is one thing, and, and that may be it, it may just be kind of piggybacking on that same question, but if you were commissioner tomorrow, what's one thing that you would change about overall the game of baseball? If there's one in addition to the grind, the, the, you know, kind of the eye test versus the analytics and if that's the same one, that's great. But do you have another thing that you would change, you know, day one as president, right? Day one as commissioner of, of baseball. Um, what's something else maybe that you would change? You know, this is where maybe I'm a little different than a lot of folks. I, I, I don't think I would change anything else. I, I, you know, I love the fact that it does grow. As I mentioned before, like the players don't change. The people don't change. They're still the same. The game's still played the same way in that regard. Uh, it's just the technology and different things are added to it. I would just be really careful about the new things that I would bring in the fold. Um, but other than that, man, I love the game the way it is. And uh, players are great at adapting to any and every change that's asked of them anyway. And I love that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I got one final question for you. So obviously you've had a, a phenomenal baseball career. Uh, you're the obviously the epitome of a baseball lifer, having spent the entire game uh, the, your entire life in the game of baseball up until this point with, with obviously the foreseeable future, God willing is going to remain the same. Um, if you didn't play baseball and you weren't a baseball coach and, and that never came to be, what's, what's something that, what, what would you have done for a living? What would you, if, if plan A and baseball was gone, what would you, uh, what would that next career choice be for you? <laughs> Maybe this is the biggest, you know, uh, well, I, I, I don't know. And maybe that's it, you know, maybe that's the, maybe that's the reason why I was able to do and continue to do what I'm doing now is because I, I really don't know. And uh, I would have figured something out. Obviously, I didn't have faith. Fortunately, I didn't have to explore that. Um, but I genuinely don't know. This is what I know. 
this is what I've done. Um, and this is what I'm passionate about finding a way to continue to make this a staple in my life and finding ways to make finances work and all these different things to work because it's what I know. And uh, if I didn't know it and love it as much, then maybe I could open my mind to doing something else. But I never saw myself doing anything different. I never understood it. And until that day comes, hopefully it doesn't, uh, I'm going to continue to not think about that. I got my education and my degree and all those things are wonderful, but this is what I do. This is who I am. And until I'm told not to, I'm just not, I'm not going to go there. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's something I can appreciate. And that's, you know, I, I heard a uh, Derek Jeter, I read a Derek Jeter quote or interview and somebody had asked him a very similar question, you know, what would you do if you weren't the shortstop of the New York Yankees? Like, I don't know. I never thought about anything other than being the shortstop of the New York Yankees. So I'll figure that out when, you know, when I'm not the shortstop of the New York Yankees anymore. Um, so yeah. I can, I can appreciate that answer for sure. Um, yeah. So one, actually two more things. What's the, what's the craziest baseball story, craziest event? Maybe it was a fight. Maybe it was a, a teammate. Maybe it was, what's the craziest thing you've seen on a baseball field? Well, we've had fights. We've had things. And I'll tell you, the craziest things are certainly not able to be shared on this uh, on this podcast. That's for sure, uh, because um, you know, baseball players are unique, man. There's there's things that are considered normal and okay, and and the you know just the norm in a baseball clubhouse that are certainly anything but normal in a typical societal setting. So um, I can't really share much of that. But we've been in fights and brawls that are always unique and and. and and memorable in that regard but some of the craziest stories are needed to be shared in a different venue that's for sure <laughs> fair enough fair enough uh wasn't there wasn't I, I think i remember a story from when you were playing summer ball out in kansas and and wasn't there snakes out in the outfield or you had to be aware of snakes oh, oh yeah Oh yeah, hundred percent. I, I a guy I was playing out there, and I just out to make a play at shortstop and short and left field. Made a play, and left fielder came in, and we kind of crossed paths. And I made the play, and I threw it back in. And the next thing you know, I hear left fielder screaming. I'm turning around, what is he doing? And I, he's there's a snake right there, and it's just gigantic bull snakes in Kansas. They have these big, whatever. They're not poisonous, whatever. And the second baseman comes running out, and he I forget what college, maybe East Carolina. I think he comes from. He comes out there. And he grabs this thing by the head and runs all the way out over, and throws it over the left field fence. And I'm like, golly, you've been around snakes all your whole life. Man. And he's like, no, I'm just so scared of them. I just couldn't handle playing this game knowing that that snake was on the field. I'm like, Bro, geez, okay. Yeah. Who? Uh, so baseball players, obviously you mentioned, are unique. It's a different kind of breed. And, you know, basketball players, baseball players, lawyers, car salesmen, right? They all have their kind of niche that other people in that profession are in that role um or in that community so baseball is highly superstitious what's the what's the craziest superstition you've ever heard of seen experienced maybe your own what are some crazy superstitions that you've been a part of i probably I, again i know that they're out there i never really paid much attention to them i'm sure i had my own i call them routines not superstitions oh way. I, um of but, course but yeah that's what they are um you know, so there's a lot of little ones about kind of how you go about getting dressed and food you eat on different game days and things like that. Um, I don't really know because I've never really paid that much attention to them except for to know that uh, we'd have certain players that would uh, go through certain dances in the clubhouse to spark a streak when things aren't going so well. And those dances were often very eventful. And uh, again, not, not <laughs> glad there were any recording devices going on in there. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, what's the, the, what's the way that we can make baseball, uh, you know, maybe more fun. And I don't, I don't get that. Like, you know, I don't need it to be more fun. I love baseball as it is three hours, three and a half hours, a one, nothing pitching duel, a, a 10, nine, you know, just slug fest. I, I love baseball in all shapes and, and sizes. Um, I don't discriminate against base. I just love baseball. So, but what's something that maybe we can make it more fun and make it more interesting or kind of capture that fringe group of people to bring them in and kind of make them um, baseball lifers, so to speak. To me, this is easy too. It, look, it, they started doing it. I love the microphones yeah. during the games. I think it's the greatest thing that we've done in a long time. I think it could take us way over the top from a baseball standpoint. I think it's the greatest. Uh, I, I'd encourage that to continue to be ramped up. We're all at the top. 
Yeah. So you would, you would be in the camp to say, Hey, multiple guys or every, you know, every, every game have at least one person from each team kind of mic'd up and get that behind the scenes perspective. No doubt. Yeah. And I, th- I think in, obviously you can speak to this as well, and then we'll kind of wrap up for real this time. Um, you know, I think I see baseball and I see football uh, players and, and obviously they've done a good job. Michael Jordan set the trend of of individualizing and really your own brand within the bigger brand. You know, there was no brands before Jumpman and Tiger Woods did the same thing mm-hmm. with golf and things like that. Um, and I th- I've, I'm in the same camp that baseball hasn't done enough to point out the individual, the individual athlete. Does that speak to because baseball is a true team sport or does it speak to baseball just kind of being old school and they're just now kind of getting used to it? Probably both. Uh, probably both. But I think, again, that'll that'll change. I mean, travel doing that a little bit. Uh, but a lot of it has to do with just the personalities of it. And um, and but but I do, it, you know, I, I do think that uh, it, we've had a little bit of it, and mainly with the crossover players with Dion and Bo Jackson and some of those guys. They had a little bit of that. Uh, I just think it's a matter of time. Uh, it'll probably come into form in in to you know in in the future. But those are transcendent, one of a kind type athletes that you're not really usually forcing to have during your generation, your lifetime. And the fact that we've had them. They've been in other sports. I think they're going to come around and they'll happen to be in baseball one of these days. Yeah, makes sense. Makes perfect sense. So uh, if if obviously as a baseball lifer, as a husband, as a dad, um, you know, recruiting or watching film for the next opponent, preparing for practice, uh, preparing for travel, spending time on the road. Obviously, baseball consumes a tremendous amount of your, your time and energy. Uh, but if you're not watching baseball, talking baseball, practicing baseball with your family. What else are you into? What are you doing? Are you out on the golf course? Are you, um, you know, what, what are you watching? How do you spend whatever little bit of free time you have, which I understand isn't much, but how do you spend your free time? Uh, so with family, uh, first and foremost, but uh, the exercise, um, I, I really enjoy that. And, um, you know, it's a good release. And, uh, you know, I don't play all much, maybe once or twice a year. That's it. Um, but uh, but I enjoy I enjoy just various forms of exercise, either on the bike or run outside or whatever. I enjoy watching some shows. So watch Ozark and some different shows and binge watch a lot of it now. Um, but but would would do that, you know, somewhat regularly even while we're in our season. So, um, you know, but the but that pretty uneventful, pretty boring in that regard. Same guy. It's what you're gonna get. Yeah. What which again is is part of I think the genius that makes you who you are. And and so. Um... You know, obviously it takes different, different people, different, different people to make a team better. And you need the consistent guys. You also need the flashy guys. You need, you kind of need that, that, that best of both worlds. But again, every team needs their Cal Ripken, their Derek Jeter, their Joey Hammond, right? Every team needs that kind of consistent, constant guy. That's that, you know what, all the other crap could be hitting the fan around us, but that guy's going to show up and give us four quality of bats and make every routine play uh, and hustle out every ground ball. So I think, you know, but you also need the guy that's going to go out there. He's maybe one for four with three strikeouts, but he hits the walk off bomb, you know? So you kind of, you need yeah, them, you need them all. Um, so to speak, to make that good team, obviously a good team and, and you kind of play their part. Yeah. So last question, are we, uh, are we pro pro swag pro bat flip? I know that's kind of a, a new thing um, to be quite frank. I'm kind of on the fence. I love it. Cause I love swag and I love flash. But at the same time, I'm old school baseball, and it's you know you do that, and you're you're wearing one in your ear hole the next at bat. So where are you at on bat flips? Uh, you know, well, first of all, I, I didn't hit enough to 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 be able to relate to that. So that, that's for <laughs> one thing. Uh, but I think there's a time and a place for everything. I really do. I mean, I think that there's certain situations and times that warrant it and uh, are understandable. Um, and if you're going to do it, then you need to be aware of repercussions and don't be frustrated by that, whether it be the form of the pitcher taking it back out on you or the pitcher showing you up when he gets a big strikeout. So I think you just, the motions are great and the way you show that are great. But I think we just need to be less sensitive about any reactions that come from that. That's part of it. If you're going to do it, that's fine. If there's the time and a place, if you're going to do it when you're down by eight runs in the last inning, that's probably not okay. And you're probably going to have to answer that. And again, I'm okay with it all the way around. Yeah. 
Yeah. All right. Last question for real. Promise. One one player, one big league player uh, that you would say, you know what? And 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 obviously the Astros kind of scandal has has kind of shaken some things up. And it's like, do we really know who these guys are? Can we really point to them as role models? Blah 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 blah. But off the field stuff aside, personality stuff aside, uh, who's a baseball player today, or maybe two or three guys that you would say, you know what? watch their work ethic or watch what they're doing, or these are some guys that you want to pay attention to those modern day uh, Cal Ripkins or Derek Jeter's that you and I grew up with. Well, they're talented guys. I think they're all, a lot of them for different reasons, but I, I think the trout plays the game really well. I think he's fun to watch. I think he's someone you should modeled after. I know he gets a lot of bad publicity, but Bryce Harper, I think plays the game the right way. I think he plays really hard. I think he's tough nose kind of a guy and he grinds and he goes all out. I don't think there's any doubt in that. And then I think you talk about professionalism now, and he's super talented in the way he carries himself as a person. I, I think Aaron Judge is, is a big role model in that regard, too. So we're talking about some of our superstars have a lot of positive traits that a lot of folks should be emulate, should emulate and, and, and learn from. Yeah, awesome. Well, listen, man, I really appreciate your time. You know, obviously, we've been trying to catch up for quite a bit. I appreciate you being the first guest on my podcast. It was important to start this podcast journey with you as a first guest, given I wouldn't be where I am with the game of baseball had I not had someone um, that I could be, you know, had, as my role model and as someone that I could look up to and kind of be my hero, both on the field and off the field. So I appreciate you taking your time. Sorry for the, all the uh, technical stuff, uh, but I really appreciate it. it and out. yes, thank you. And uh, so hopefully we will see each other. I know I was supposed to see you this weekend at, at, uh, at Charlottesville and we're disappointed, but Glad that we did get one game in at least. And I keep going back and watching the last, the Sunday Wake Forest Louisville game. That's on demand. I keep, I've, I've seen the first three innings of that game about a hundred times. Cause by the time I'm done my lunch, that's when it's, I, I'm like, all right, I need to get back to work. So I've, I've seen the first three innings of that game a bunch of times, but, um, but yeah, man. So obviously stay safe, give the family my best, uh, miss you guys. And uh, we'll see you soon, but thank you again for your time. Really appreciate it. Well, I appreciate it. I appreciate what you're doing here for these people. Hopefully they can appreciate it also. Thanks, man. Have a good one.